So this is the topic for today, flat foot. And we're going to go into quite some depths. Uh, you know, obviously, we can divide it into pediatric flat foot, adolescent flat foot, and adult flat foot. And in pediatric flat foot, again, you've got flexible or physiological or postural, and then you've got your fixed flat foot. In adolescents, there are two main conditions, tarsal coalitions and accessory naviculars, which we'll discuss. And in adult flat foot, mainly we'll discuss tibialis posterior insufficiency, because that's the most common uh, which features in your exams. So, you know, we know that, you know, a foot has got multiple arches. You've got the medial arch, you've got a lateral arch, you've got your uh, transverse tarsal arch. But probably the most important of those is the medial arch. Now, why do you need an arch? First of all, one may ask, why do we need an arch? This is because if you look at the foot, the foot is a segmented structure. And to support the weight, a segmented structure requires an arch to support the weight best. The second reason is it helps in shock absorption. And the third very important reason is propulsion. So the three buzzwords, if someone asks you what's the function of the medial arch, is support, absorption, and propulsion. Aphasius auth is all about buzzwords. And these buzzwords should come out in the answers. Now, the important thing is the medial longitudinal arch. So what does it comprise of? The bony structure. It's got the calcaneum, the talus, the navicular, the three cuneiforms, and the three metatarsals. These comprise the medial longitudinal arch, and that's what we're going to focus on. Now, obviously, you've got the structures which stabilize it, which can be divided into static and dynamic. And static, of course, has got the bony and ligaments, and dynamic is the most important is the tip post. So amongst the static structures, probably you should, the most important you should know about is the spring ligament. And this is really important in the understanding of the management of flat foot. So the spring ligament, also called the plantar talo calcaneo navicular ligament. And if you look at the diagram there, you can see the two bands there. And these are the spring ligament. They basically go from the substantulum tali of the calcaneum right to the navicular. And they actually act like a hammock supporting the talus. So essentially, it is the plantar part of the talo navicular joint, the plantar medial part of the talonavicular joint. And this is really important structure, which is a very important static stabilizer of the medial arch. So then, of course, the dynamic stabilizer. The dynamic stabilizer, as I said, is a tibialis posterior. As everyone would know, tibialis posterior inserts to all the bones of the foot except the talus. And every insertion of the tibialis posterior has got a role to play. Its insertion on the navicular is to elevate the medial margin of the foot. Its insertion on the sustanculum tali is to support the talus. Its insertion to the third to the fifth metatarsal is to supinate the foot. So basically, it has basically got all the three parts has got a role in supinating as well as elevating the medial arch. And tip, and we, you know, we always talk when we talk about the gait in the stance phase of gait, we always talk about tip and we talk about gastrosoleus. But you know what? The tip post is another very important muscle which actually plays a role in the stance phase of the gait. So what is the role of the tip post in the gait cycle? So before we actually get into flat foot individually, let's talk about the tip post because it plays a function in all flat feet. So if you look at the heel strike, so when you have the heel strike, there is, a, you know, there is an eccentric contraction of the tibialis anterior there, which prevents the foot to slap down. But as the heel strikes, the subtalar joint is in valgus. And this causes the forefoot unlocking. So as a result, the forefoot is very flexible. And that's why it acts like a good shock absorber. So from the moment of the heel strike, the tibialis posterior starts to work. After the heel strike, the tibialis posterior comes to play. And most of its function is in mid-stance. So there's an eccentric contraction of the tibialis posterior in the mid-stance. So at the heel strike, the foot is in slight supination. But as you go to mid-stance, the foot starts to pronate. And the tibialis posterior is very important with this, with this function. So as the foot pronates, the foot achieves a flat foot position. And this is very important, the foot to be flat in mid-stance. Because if it's flat, the weight-bearing axis will go to the center of the foot. And that's very important. It won't overload the medial or the lateral side. So that's uniform loading of the foot achieved because the tip post pronates the foot and basically keeps the foot flat on mid-stance. And then during the terminal stance, there's a concentric contraction of the tip post now. And as a result, the foot supinates again. And because the foot supinates, the heel inwards, the forefoot, the talonavicular and the calcaneocuboid joints, the midfoot, they become locked. 
and the foot becomes a rigid lever and this gives you the push off during the terminal swing. So this is a function, you can see if the tip post is not having this concentric contraction now, your foot will not be a very rigid lever and will not be an efficient push off. You will lack an efficient push off. So that's what we said is the tip post main function is during mid stance and terminal stance. That's the two phases of the gait cycle where the tip post is working initially with eccentric contraction and later as concentric contraction. So the flat foot, what are the effects of the flat foot? So during mid stance, we expect the foot to be flat. But if you have a flat foot, the weight bearing axis shifts to the inside of the foot rather than to the center of the foot. And because the weight bearing axis shifts to the inside, there's an internal rotation of the femur, there's an internal rotation of the knee, there's an internal rotation of the tibia, which increases the Q angle and that increases petlofemoral pain. And that's why flat foot just doesn't affect the foot. It also affects the knee, affects the hip, and affects your lower back. So before again going to individual feet, it's very important to understand the radiology of any flat foot. So you know, flat foot is a triplane deformity. You know, there's a deformity in the sagittal plane where there's a sagging of the talonavicular joint. So there's a sagging in the sagittal plane. And you can determine the sagging by two important parameters, the Meary's angle and the calcaneal pitch, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. The deformity in the frontal pain is the heel valgus, and that you can look out for the talocalcaneal angles. And the deformity in the forefoot is in the transverse plane, which is forefoot abduction. So there's a deformity in all three planes, and forefoot abduction you get by the talus first metatarsal angle and the talonavicular coverage angle. I'm going to describe all three. So this is the Meary's angle, which is a talus first metatarsal angle. So normally we expect the talus and the first metatarsal to be in line. This is the lateral view of the foot and the angle needs to be zero. However, in flat foot, because of the sagging at the talonavicular joint, you can see that the angle increases to above zero and it is convex plantarwards. So this is an important part of the Meary's angle. So the Meary's angle of zero to 15 is mild, 15 to 30 is moderate and more than 30 is severe flat foot. Then we are talking about the calcaneal pitch. So calcaneal pitch is a line along the inferior border of the calcaneum and line along the plantar surface of the foot. And normally it ranges from about 25 to 45. So here you can see that this in a, in a flat foot, the calcaneal pitch would, may, may be reduced. So that's the other important thing which tells you there's a sagittal plane problem. Then if you look at the, uh, the hind foot valgus, it's by the talocalcaneal angle. You know, Kite, he is the one who described the talocalcaneal angle in the AP view. But you know, it's very difficult to demonstrate talus and calcaneum in AP view. So it's better to measure it in the lateral view. And so again, if the talocalcaneal angle is increased, so normally it's between 25 and 45. If it's increased, then it's a valgus foot. And if it's decreased, it's a varus foot. And then you've got the forefoot abduction. Now, this is a very important part of flat foot. And you guys should understand this part. The midfoot subluxes laterally. There's a stalar uncovering. And that produces forefoot abduction. And it's very important to identify this forefoot abduction. So there is the talonavicular coverage angle. So if you look at this, you draw a line along the articular surface of the talus and along the articular surface of the navicular. And that, uh, the angle between these two, it should be zero to three degrees. So that's a normal. In other words, the navicular should completely cover the talar head. Whereas if you look at in this, uh, the next X-ray, you can see that navicular has subluxed laterally. So the talonavicular coverage angle increases beyond three degrees. So this is uncovering of the navicular uh, of the talus. This is the talonavicular coverage angle. And then you've got the talus first metatarsal angle. So normally the talus and the first metatarsal are collinear. But in the flat foot, because the talus deviates medially and the navicular goes laterally, the line through the talus goes medial to the first metatarsal. So this is called the talus first metatarsal angle. So these are the important angles which we need to know before we actually handle any flat foot. So now we go to the, other, the, the, the first important part of the flat foot, the pediatric flat foot. So the pediatric flat foot can be divided into two types, which could be either flexible or fixed, or it could be asymptomatic and symptomatic. So the, the flexible or the asymptomatic pediatric flat foot are two types, the physiological flat foot or the postural flat foot or the calcaneovalgus foot. Important, calcaneovalgus is sometimes kept in the viva in the FRCS author, and it's very important to recognize this condition. So this is a calcinovalgus foot. Essentially, it's a packaging disorder. 
So when it's a packaging disorder, it is associated with other packaging disorders, which includes DDH, which includes torticollis, which includes metatarsal reductus. So when they start to, to, to take you through the slides of the calcinovalgus foot, please say that you want to examine the hips to rule out DDH. So in this, what happens is, it's a flexible type of flat foot. In other words, the, both the dorsiflexion as well as the heel valgus are correctable. So the heel is completely dorsiflexed here, but it is correctable. You can plantar flex the foot. And generally, all it needs is just gentle manipulation. And majority of these will correct by the age of nine months. However, beware. If you have a calcaneus valgus foot with this deformity in the leg called posterior medial tibial bowing, then the posterior medial tibial bowing may result in a limb length discrepancy at maturity. So if there's a calcaneus valgus with the posterior medial bowing of the tibia, the children have to be followed on till maturity because if the posterior medial bowing doesn't resolve on its own, they will have a limb length dif difference of up to 3 to 11 centimeters. So beware calcanovalgus foot with posterior medial bowing of the tibia. The other common flat foot in the child which is asymptomatic is the physiological flat foot. All children are born with flat feet. This is because the arch is absent at birth. They have generalized ligamentous laxity. They've got fat pads in the sole, so the arch is not very apparent. And the arch can take up to 10 years to develop, the first decade. So that's why when you get referrals of a six-year or a five-year-old child with a flat foot, you just have to reassure them because the arch can take up to 10 years to develop. So the important thing about this flat foot is it's bilateral, it's asymptomatic, and about 3% persists in the adult population. So what are the screening tests? So you ask the child to go up on the toes, so you can see this is the flat foot, but as soon as the child goes up on the toes, the arch comes back and the heel goes into varus. So it is completely correctable. Similarly, you can ask the child to go on the inner and outer border of the foot, which means the subtalar joint is supple. And you can see when the child is sitting down, their arch is present, but when he stands, the arch goes away. That shows it's a flexible foot. And always check for the Baton score. And please don't forget to, st to study the Staheli's rotational profile. Because flat foot can be associated with torsional deformities in the femur and the tibia. So please test for the Staheli's rotational profile, which is, you know, hip internal external rotation, high foot angle, etc. So the, why can a flat foot, which is physiological, cause pain? Yes, it can. You know, majority of the time is asymptomatic, but minority of the times it can cause pain. The reason being, normally the dorsiflexion, when you dorsiflex the foot, it occurs at the ankle. But in, because in these patients, the, the tendericles is quite tight, dorsiflexion bypasses the ankle and there's a midfoot break and dorsiflexion actually occurs at the midfoot and that causes pain in the midfoot. And secondly, because of the hindfoot valgus, you can get calcinofibular impingement. So they can get pain on the lateral side, impingement of the peroneal tendons. And also because of the medial prominence of the talus, they can have callosities on the medial side. So beware heel cord or tendoicles tightness in physiological flat feet. That's the only condition where physiological flat feet may need treatment is when they have tight heel cords. So how do you assess for heel cord tightness? It's very important that when you have a physiological flat foot to assess for tendoicles tightness before you do the silver squid test, you need to correct the heel valgus and correct the forefoot supination. That's very important. Only then you should check for tendoicles tightness. Don't check the tendoicles tightness with the heel and valgus because then the dorsiflexion may occur at the midfoot. So what is the treatment then? Asymptomatic, flexible flat foot, nothing to do. Just reassure them. I tell my patients that Hussein Bolt had flat feet and he's the world's fastest man. So what is there to worry? So generally asymptomatic, flexible flat feet can be completely left alone. You can do physiotherapy with Achilles tendon stretching and tibialis posterior strengthening and proprioception. And whether insoles or shoe modifications actually work in asymptomatic flexible flat foot is a big mystery. And this mystery was solved by a gentleman called Wenger et al. who did this uh, prospective study on 129 people or children, dividing them into four groups, three where they had shoe modifications or heel inserts, and one where he did nothing. And he found that there was no difference in, uh, at the three-year follow-up. So therefore, really giving them insoles when they are asymptomatic and flexible, it's a waste of time. 
On the other hand, if they, if they become painful, there is a role of the insoles. So you can give them either shoe modifications, insoles or AFOs, and of course, physiotherapy to do heel, heel, heel stretching or heel cord stretching. Now, there are surgeries, obviously, you know, if, the, if it's, it's a flexible, painful, a flat foot is painful and conservative treatment fails, you can consider surgeries. Very rarely we have to do them, especially in the black population because they have got quite severe flat feet, which can be painful. And so, you know, the problem in flat foot is the lateral column is short. So you can do lateral column lengthenings. And in addition to that, you do a lot of soft tissue release. You have to release the heel cord or Achilles tendon. You have to advance the tibialis posterior because tibialis posterior is very lax. So you need to tighten it and you may have to lengthen the peroneal tendons. Now the calcaneal osteotomies which are sorted out for this condition is the lateral column lengthening. How the lateral column lengthening acts is it is an osteotomy done at the neck of the calcaneum and you jack it open. So basically the fulcrum of this osteotomy is a talonavicular joint. So what it does is it basically uh, re reduces the talonavicular subluxation and restores the talonavicular anatomy and restores the arch of the foot. So as you can see here, this is where we do the lateral column opening. We make an osteotomy of the calcaneum. We jack it open with the Hinterman retractor. And as you can see that as soon as you jack it open, you see how the foot straightens out, the arch comes back, and then you put a tricortical ilia crest graft, or you can even nowadays, you can put these tantalum wedges to open the calcaneal osteotomy. So thus, it can correct your midfoot forefoot abduction. It can correct your talonavicular sag. And also, it may even correct your heel valgus. If the heel valgus doesn't correct by this procedure, then you may have to do a calcaneal shift. The other, very, the other thing which is actually coming into a lot of play now with uh, flexible, painful, flat feet is this. This is called the sinus tarsi implant. So essentially what you do is it's called arthroresis. So instead of doing a lateral calcaneal opening osteotomy, you're actually producing, putting an implant like a screw in the sinus tarsi. So that jacks open the sinus tarsi and prevents the lateral collapse of the sinus tarsi and acts like a lateral column lengthening. Its uh, advantages are it's a very simple uh, uh, procedure and it's sometimes done as a day surgery. Sometimes it's done even under local anesthesia in the US. But the disadvantages are you can do overstuffing of the sinus tarsi or you can do under correction. So that's a problem. And obviously you're putting a foreign material inside. So that's the disadvantage. So this was a patient who had a sinus tarsi implant and you can see that it corrected the talonavicular uncovering corrected quite well as seen on the x-rays on the right side. And you can see these are the evidences to say that the sinus tarsi implant actually works. So the next important topic is the pediatric fixed flat foot. So we finished the pediatric flexible flat foot, which was calcinovalgus and physiological. The pediatric flex flat foot, you mainly have to remove, remember only one main condition, and that is the congenital vertical talus. So it is also called the rocker bottom foot. So here what happens is the hind foot is in fixed equinus, the midfoot is in fixed dorsiflexion, the forefoot is in fixed abduction. So in the main pathology in this is a dorsal dislocation of the talonavicular joint. That's the main pathology in CVT. So if you remember that, what is the pathology in CVT is dorsal dislocation of the talonavicular joint. Now they have asked this next, this has been asked in the exam, what are the associations of CVT? The associations of CVT are neurological disorders and chromosomal or genetic syndrome. And the third thing, obviously, it could be idiopathic. So neurological disorders like meningomyelocele or arthrogyphosis and genetic syndromes like trisomy 13, 15 and 18. And if it's idiopathic, it is also genetic and possibly an autosomally dominant inheritance. So please remember associations of CVT, the two buzzwords you need to remember, neurological disorders and genetic conditions. So what is the point problems in CCT? So you can see the hind foot is in equinus. As you can see on the x-ray, the talus and the calcaneum both are in equinus. They are pointing down. And the forefoot is in dorsiflexion. That's because of the dorsal dislocation of the talonavicular joint and contracted anterior tibial muscles or the dorsiflexes of the foot. So this is why you get a rocker bottom deformity because the forefoot is dorsiflex and the hindfoot is equinus. So you get a convex plantar deformity. So the hindfoot is in fixed equinovalgus. The forefoot is in abduction and dorsiflexion and the plantar surface of the foot is convex. 
And that's why it's called a rocker bottom foot. So it's very, very, very important to identify this at, at birth or very early in life because this needs immediate treatment. So x-rays for a CVT, I mean, obviously you can do a lot, but the most important is the lateral x-ray of the foot in neutral position and the lateral x-ray of the foot in the forced plantar flexion position. So that's the lateral x-ray of the foot in the neutral position. So you can see if you draw a line through the talus, it should normally be aligned with the metatarsals. The navicular does, is not ossified until the age of three. So you cannot see the navicular in this foot. So you just look, go with the metatarsals. So you can see here the line through the talus is actually going plantar. It is not going through, but going plantar to the metatarsals. And then if you do a lateral view with the force maximal plantar flexion, you can see the talus still goes plantar to the metatarsal and it doesn't align with the metatarsals even in maximum plantar flexion. So this has to be differentiated by a condition called uh, oblique talus. And in the oblique talus, you can see that in maximum plantar flexion, the, you can see that the talus actually aligns with the metatarsals. So management of the congenital or oblique talus is uh, usually it is. It was in, it's so, uh, so far it was surgery where you can do a one-stage procedure or a two-stage procedure where you do a large Cincinnati incision and you have to do a lot of soft tissue and bony releases to reduce the talonavicular joint. But they found that surgery, unfortunately, results in a very stiff foot. So therefore now, DOBS, that's D-O-B-B-S, has actually gone for serial casting, which is called the reverse poncetti. In club foot, you've got poncetti. Here, you've got reverse poncetti. So you do the serial casting to reduce the talonavicular joint and then an Achilles stenotomy to correct the uh, equinus in the ankle. So this poncetti or reverse poncetti is the other. So this was a child who presented late. So he needed the one stage surgical release. You can see the Cincinnati incision on the uh, figure on the right and you can see the correction. But remember, uh, this is x-rays. Uh, you can see preoperatively the, uh, the, uh, the vertical talus. And the x-ray on the right uh, bottom lateral view shows that it's corrected. But remember, now the treatment for uh, uh, CVT is reverse poncetti with Achilles stenotomy. You may need to do an open reduction of the talonavicular joint or it may reduce spontaneously. But remember, reverse poncetti. So then we go to the adolescent flat foot. Adolescent flat foot, two important conditions, the accessory navicular and also the calcaneo navicular and the tarsal coalition. These are the two conditions. So the, the adolescent rigid flat foot is a very important short case in the exam and it's a tarsal coalition unless proved otherwise. It is a failure of segmentation. It is an autosomally dominant inheritance. It is also called a misnomer, peroneal spastic flat foot. That's a misnomer. The peronei are tight because the heel has been in valgus for a long time. So actually they are not in spasm. So that's a misnomer. And it's bilateral in 50 to 60% of the cases. So the, two, the commonest site is the calcaneo-navicular site. And in the talocalcaneal site, it's the middle facet of the talocalcaneal site. So this is the calcaneal navicular, and that's the middle facet of the talocalcaneal. There are other uncommon sites, but you don't need to know about them. The most common is calcaneal navicular and the middle facet of the talocalcaneal. Now, classification. Obviously, it depends on the degree of ossification. If it's fully ossified bar, then it's called a synostosis. If it's a partially ossified bar, it's called a synchondrosis. And if it's a non-ossified bar, it's called a syndesmosis. And synostosis is generally associated with PFFD and fibula hemimelia. So the symptoms are pain, and pain generally corresponds to the site of the bar. In calcaneo navicular, it's on the, in the sinus tarsi, and in the middle facet of the subtalar, it's on the medial ankle joint. In addition, it also present, the presentation is when, does the, when the bar ossifies. Calcaneo navicular, the pain is generally between 9 and 13 years, and talocalcaneal is in much later, 13 to 15 years. This is when the bar ossifies. And of course, the signs is a fixed flat foot. So when you ask him to go up on the toes, the heel valgus will not correct. So radiographs we already described, but the important thing is remember the 45 degree oblique views and axial views. So the 45 degree oblique view shows the calcaneal navicular coalition best. And of course, the lateral view for the talocalcaneal coalition is seen in the lateral view. And there you see what you call as a C sign. The C sign is not typical for a coalition. Any valgus foot can produce a C sign because the top of the talus merges with the substanticulum of the calcaneum in a valgus foot. So any valgus foot can produce C sign. 
Okay, further investigations are uh, for the secondary changes. You can see, apart from the primary that is seeing the correlation, you can see secondary changes. And one is the Taylor beaking. And you can see the anteater nose sign, which is a prolongation of the anterior process of the calcaneum. Uh, uh, further imaging you can do, which is CT scans, which shows you, especially the, the talocalcaneal coalitions quite well. And you can do the MRI scans, especially for the cartilage and its coalitions. So uh, most of the time, it can be an incidental finding, and it needs to be treated only if painful. The important thing is uh, treatment is always uh, conservative. Remember, always try some insoles, try even a plaster sometimes for three to four weeks, and then an insole. And if conservative treatment fails, then the calcaneo navicular collisions, they do quite well if you do early surgery on them, where you reject the bar and you interpose the extensive distal and brevis. And whereas in the, if it's a later adult, uh, then you can still try excision of the coalition, but you may have to do a subtalar fusion. In a talocalcaneal uh, coalition, on the other hand, you'll see that the most important thing is they do quite badly with excisions, though middle facet coalitions do well with, can do well with excisions. Posterior facet coalitions generally need subtalar fusion. So next we go to accessory navicular. So the incidence of that is 4 to 14 percent is generally bilateral. Most of the time it's asymptomatic, just seen as a bulge on the medial side of the foot. Now obviously there are three important types. The type 1 is a small ossicle in the substance of the tibialis posterior. It's got no connection with the navicular. Type 2 is about 1.1 to 1.3 centimeter size bone which is connected to the navicular with a cartilaginous joint. And type 3 is where it fuses with the navicular and you can't see it as a separate bone. The commonest is type 2. Now, again, x-rays, the lateral oblique view are quite good. You can see, you can see the uh, ossicle there. And you can even do MRI scans where you can see the high signal in the accessory navicular as well as in the main navicular, both in the T1 and T2 weighted images. So that what happens is they produce a medial prominence and they also medialize the insertion of the tip post. And that, that's how they produce black foot. So most of the time, if they're asymptomatic, you don't need to do anything at all. Oh, sorry, what happened? Sorry, yeah. But obviously, if there is an injury, then there is a pull on the synchondrosis, so they can get symptomatic. And if they're symptomatic, again, it's conservative, conservative, conservative. NSAIDs, below knee cast. And if a painful non-union, especially in the type 2, then you can do an excision. When you do an excision, you basically split the tip post and excise it. Don't advance the tip post, which is called the Kinder's procedure. Now, we don't need to do the Kinder's procedure. All we need to do is just excise it. Okay, the comes final topic, the adult flat foot. It's, this is probably the most important topic because it features a lot on the FRCS ORF exam. And that's the tibialis posterior insufficiency. So as we already said, the tibialis posterior has got three important roles because of its multitude attachments to the foot. So through the attachment to the navicular, it raises the medial margin of the foot. Through the attachment to the sustanculum, it supports the talus. And through the attachment to the metatarsals, it supinates the foot. So the, the, what happens is because of the chronic overload of the tibialis posterior, initially the tendon gets inflamed. Later, the tendon tears. And later, because of the deformity, you develop arthritis. So these are the three stages of the tibialis posterior insufficiency. So it's a multiplanar deformity. As we said, you get the hind foot goes into valgus. The forefoot starts abducting and supinating. And there's also medial column instability at the talonavicular or the first TMT joint. So classification of tip posts is asked in the exam. And you know the earlier classification was Johnson and Strom, who basically just classified it based on the presence of the hind foot deformity. And later, Meerson added on the ankle involvement. So Meerson did a modification of the Johnson and Strom. But now we actually also follow the Blumen and Meerson's classification. We just don't look at the hind foot deformity, but look at the forefoot deformity, the ankle, and the median column instability, which is a more comprehensive classification. So the Johnson and Storm, you know, as we said, stage one, there's no deformity. Stage two, there's a flexible hind foot deformity. Stage three, there's a fixed hind foot deformity. And stage four, added by Meyerson, is when there's involvement of the ankle. Whereas Blumen and Meyerson et al. refined this classification. And this is very good, you know. So he says stage one, no deformity. Stage two, there's a, a flexible hind foot deformity. But he divides that into 2B and 2C. 
Two B, when there's a midfoot abduction, so producing a forefoot abduction, and two C, when there is also first TMT hypermobility. And similarly, stage three is basically a rigid hindfoot deformity. And stage four is the ankle deformity, which can be again 4A, where it's flexible, and 4B, it's fixed. So I think this is a more comprehensive tree, uh, classification. So the risk factors of tip post is generally in the fifth and sixth decade of life, and usually in obese uh, ladies, it's very common in females. Pre existing flat foot is a risk factor. Diabetes, corticosteroid use, and sometimes zero negative inflammatory arthropathy. So what happens, as we said, in stage one, where there's only some inflammation of the tip post, you may notice some pain along the medial side of the tip post, along the tip post and the medial ankle. Uh, there could be swelling there. So you can, see, you can see the swelling sometimes there. There could be swelling along the tip post. Uh, there may be also flattening of the arch. But most important is, this is a correctable deformity. So the patient can go on double heel and single heel. It corrects both. He can do the single heel raise. So even if you ask him to stand on one heel or the toes on one side, it, it, the, the deformity corrects. Then it goes to stage two where the tip post ruptures. So as a result, you get a proper deformity here. The heel goes into valgus. And in 2B, the forefoot starts abducting. And in 2C, also the first TMT hypermobility sets in. So here, the patient will not be able to do the single heel, but will be able to do the double heel. The reason he cannot do the single heel is because to, in, order to, in order to supinate the foot when you go up on your heel, you need the initiation to be done by tip post and subsequent ankle equinus is done by Achilles tendon. But because the tip post is not working in this, the tip post is torn, the tip post cannot initiate the supination. That's why he cannot do a single heel. But when he does a double heel, the initiation of supination is done by the opposite foot. So then he can carry on with the tendo Achilles on the same side. And then, of course, the stage three, where you get a fixed deformity and obviously with a stiff subtalar joint. So this is your stage three. As you can see, it's a fixed deformity. It doesn't correct. And you have a stiff subtalar joint. So what are the investigations you do? Well, you can do x-rays. We already talked about, you know, the Meary's angle, the talus first metatarsal angle. And also you can see some calcinofibular impingement in the AP views. But uh, you may also see more advanced stages where you can see arthritis in the talonavicular and the subtalar joints. So these are the X-rays features of advanced tip post insufficiency. And of course, you can do MRI scans where in T2-weighted images, you can see a lot of inflammation or sometimes tip post ruptures, uh, both on T1 and T2-weighted images. You can even do ultrasound scan. But the treatment, so usually stage one is just an inflammation of the tip post. So all you need to do is NSAIDs and rest. And you can give them supports like a tip post brace, or you can do a UCBL insert, or you can and also, of course, physiotherapy. Very rarely, you can do a tenosynovectomy, especially if it's seronegative arthritis causing tip post uh, synovitis. Now, stage two, as we said, we divide it into 2A, 2B, and 2C. So in 2A, where the heel is mainly a hind foot deformity and the midfoot is okay, so you can't see too many toes sign. So there you can just do a, a medial calcaneal shift with FDL transfer to the tip post. This is because the deformity is flexible. And these people generally have pain on the medial and lateral side of the ankle. So here you basically do a medial calcaneal shift through an extra articular oblique osteotomy of the calcaneum. You're shifting the calcaneum medially to correct the hindfoot valgus. And you're also using the FDL tendon. Uh, we are routing it from the navicular from planta to dorsal to augment the tip post. Uh, stage 2B, because there is a midfoot abduction, you need to correct the midfoot abduction along with the hindfoot deformity. So there you can do a lateral column lengthening. And in stage 2C, because there is also a first a TMT hypermobility, you can do a planta flexion or a, or a, sorry, a dorsal open wedge osteotomy of the medial cuneiform. This is because once you correct the heel valgus, the forefoot goes into supination. So in order to pronate the forefoot, you may have to do a cotton osteotomy, which is a dorsal open wedge osteotomy of the medial cuneiform. So these are the X-rays where we have done a heel shift, FDL transfer, lateral column lengthening, and a cotton osteotomy to correct a stage 2C tip post insufficiency. And of course, the stage 3, where you basically got arthritis at the talonavicular and subtalar joint, now, normally we do, they used to do traditionally triple arthrodesis, 
But the disadvantage of the triple arthrodesis is the calcinocuboid joint is not generally involved in flat foot. And because a lateral column is short, if you do a calcinocuboid fusion, you're further shortening the lateral column. So nowadays, we do a dipple fusion and not a triple fusion. So we do only a dipple fusion, which is just a talonavicular and calcinocuboid fusion. And not, uh, sorry, talonavicular and subtalar fusion, not a calcinocuboid fusion. So conclusions is dip post is a complex problem. It needs to be managed depending on the what stage it is and what are the patient symptoms. And you have to have an individualized treatment plan. And results are quite good with conservative treatment. But obviously, you need to go in early if you go into stage through two to prevent a stage three. Of course, stage four tipos, I haven't spoken about that. But stage four tipos is basically because of a long-standing valgus producing a deltoid insufficiency. So in 2A, it produces a correctable ankle valgus. So you can do a deltoid reconstruction. Whereas in 2, uh, sorry, 4A, whereas in 4B, it produces ankle arthritis. So there you'll have to do a hind foot fusion. So this concludes the brief discussion about the pediatric adolescent and adult flat foot. Remember, it features a lot as short and intermediate cases on the FRCS as well as viva. So please play a lot of importance to this flat foot topic. Thank you. I think we also have a lower limb and pediatric FRCS auth revision course, which I conduct in Woolwich. I'm one of the convener along with OR UK. And uh, the next course is in autumn. So if you have any interest, you can email ORUK and you can, they will tell you whether it's going to be face-to-face -face or whether virtual. That depends on the situation then. But we do, uh, uh, we basically concentrate on lower limb and pediatric orthopedics. So it's quite a detailed lower limb and pediatric orthopedic uh, uh, examination. Also, there are some textbooks. Uh, first year's revision textbooks, which the ORUK have been involved in. And if you are interested in any, please email Ruth or get in touch with ORUK. And uh, obviously, if you are, if you are to help uh, into, with charity purposes, you can always donate into ORUK. So this concludes the topic on flat foot. Uh, we are open to questions. Lovely. Thank you, Mr. Bajaj. That was a very comprehensive lecture. Uh, very focused. You covered the whole topic uh, very beautifully. Um, if anything, we will all wish one of my mentors also said the same, that we wish we have listened to this before our exams, but I'm happy um, future candidates are, have, can make advantage of this now. So it's really, really a beautiful lecture. And um, as I said, it is a lot there, and I might not everyone might not have got it all in one go. So it will be, as I said, rec it's recorded and will be posted uh, later. So I um, obviously there is uh, we have some CQ questions, but before we go there, there is just uh, a couple of um, small questions we have received. I think um, the lecture was comprehensive enough, so it's not um, it covered everything basically. But uh, we have a question from um, Ahmad. He has asked about reverse Ponsetti method. Is that a, a, a topic that could be asked in the FRCS? Should we worried about it and? Uh, Yes, I think, uh, Firaz, now reverse ponsity is actually gaining a lot of popularity because uh, surgical management of CVT is very difficult and it produces a very stiff foot because there's too much surgery involved. So in reverse ponsity, what we are doing is we are doing the reverse steps of the ponsity. So here we are actually plantar flexing the ankle rather than dorsiflexing it. We are plantar flexing and inverting it. So the first five, six casts, we are plantar flexing the ankle and inverting the foot. And at the fifth cast, the foot actually resembles a club foot. It becomes like a club foot. And then you do that Achilles tenotomy like you do in the Pond City and you correct the ankle equinus and then you put it further into a plaster. But only thing is once you correct, the, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you reduce the talonavicular joint uh, after five weeks, we put a K wire to hold the talonavicular joint reduced and then do an Achilles tenotomy and then put the final cast. And after that, we again put them in a brace just like in club foot. Like there, we put them in a Dennis Brown splint. We here again put them in a, in a dynamic brace so that uh, for two years and uh, just like club foot. So it's exactly like club foot, but it's a reverse of it. So you should know about reverse ponsity. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for explaining this. I think that answers uh, Ahmed's question. Another question from Atif. He's asked if you, if you do a CT scan that confirms there is bony coalition, do you still have to do an MRI scan or is it not necessary? Well, I mean, the problem is I have been caught out in a few instances. What has happened is some of, of some of the patients, they have 
a bony coalition and in addition they have got a fibrous coalition involving other joint so one of the patient had a middle facet bony coalition of the subtalar joint and a fibrous coalition of the calcaneal avicular joint so i tend to do both and the other important thing about the mri is also it will highlight or show a high signal around the bony coalition telling you that the pain is actually coming from the coalition so it actually tells you that you know it pinpoints to you that the problem is actually the coalition and not anything else and also it tells you the status of the subtalar joint if you do the mri so you can see if the subtalar joint is already showing changes then you, the, the the prognosis is quite pro reserved for such individuals so i tend to do both thank you very much that makes a lot of sense and again for the exam for the exam as long as you can you know explain your answer i mean in this manner it would be great isn't it um we have one more questions from Fikri. It's about the arthrolysis screw. Uh, do you remove it, and, and when do you remove it? If you see arthrolysis is especially very good in pediatric population when you have got two years of growth left. So what we are doing in arthrolysis is we are jacking out the sinus tarsi. So with the sinus tarsi jacked out, we allow the soft tissues to grow. So then what happens is once the child reaches maturity, you take the screw out. So by then, the, the soft tissues would have grown in the right tension. So that's the aim. But you can now be also using in adults, it is used, used as an adjunct procedure. So say, for example, I do a tip post reconstruction. Then I can put the sinus tarsi implant to support my tip post reconstruction, you see. So it doesn't allow the sinus tarsi to collapse. And afterwards, you can take it out in the future. So, you, so the, it's, it can be used either as an adjunct or it can be used as a corrective procedure. In pediatrics, it is used as a corrective procedure. But in adults, it is used as an adjunct. Thank you, Mr. Rajaj. One more question from um, Mark. He's asked, why is, is interposition, soft tissue interposition, mandatory uh, after take coalition? Or does it coalition regrow again? Or why do you have to do that procedure? Well, the most important uh, disadvantage of a calcium and avicular coalition is recurrence of the coalition, unfortunately. The coalition growing back is one of the most common complications. So we need to put something in the gap to prevent the coalition to grow again. And the good thing is, just at the roof of the sinus tarsi, you've got this muscle, extensor distorium brevis, which is completely a vestigial muscle waste. So you can actually put it as a gap filler, and that prevents the recurrence. So it is definitely a good idea after excision of the coalition to put, interpose the EDB, which is present right there and prevent the recurrence of the coalition. That's very good. I think, um, I think that's, um, that's uh, all the questions. Uh, Alice, Sichuan, um, have you... Um, any... well, the, the questions are quite simple um, in terms of what they're asking. They're, to be honest with you, one of the simplest questions is when do you remove uh, implants when you do arthrolysis? Um, yeah, as we said, you know, in pediatrics, it's generally two, three yeah. years, and adults, as soon as the tip post stabilizes. Okay. Um, and one other question is there any, is, if there's hypervulnerability in the medial corneum, you should do fusion rather than cotton. Would you do a fusion rather than cotton osteotomy? Well, I mean, it depends. Once you correct the heel valgus, if the forefoot supinates, because generally that's what happens, then you have to do a cottons to actually pronate it. Otherwise, the foot won't reach the flow. Whereas if the forefoot doesn't supinate, then it's just a case of hypermobility at the TMT, but the forefoot supination is flexible and you can correct it, then you can do a first TMT fusion. Thank you. Um, one of the questions was, uh, this is not for you, but just so we can finish the answer, how can you register for other meetings? Or UK will send out an email bomb uh, with the registration for further meetings. We usually have them on a weekly basis. Also, uh, within the Telegram uh, participation, uh, FRCS participant group, we send out reminders of when the meetings are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. By the way, um, I, I just want to say I, I loved your talk before. I, I remember exactly this talk. This is why I recognized you straight away. Thank you. Um, thank you, so thank much. you very much. It's oh, just a beautiful reminder of uh, thank, you. thank you, Firas, for your good words. Thank you. One, uh, just one more question before we move on to no. the MCQs is, is from Atif. You asked, why do you use FHL and not FDL to transfer? So normally we use FDL for us, not FHL. So he's got it wrong. It's FDL we use, not the FHL. 
The okay. region we use FDL is, FDL, if you look at the muscle, it's actually more comparable to the power of the tip post. If you look at it, it's a much bigger muscle belly. So it's actually the power of the FDL, it can match up to the tip post better than the FHL. And secondly, you know, if, if you sacrifice the FHL and you lose plantar flexion of the big toe, which is a bigger disability than losing plantar flexion of the lesser toes. So you, that way, FDL is more expendable. Thank you very much, Bajar. So we'll, um, we'll move on now to the MCQs. If uh, Uth could kindly put on the questions and Mr. Bajaj will take us through him. Okay. So, um, so guys, the questions are anonymous, just, but we do need the kind of understanding if you do understand the topic. So please do uh, fill out the questions. We won't proceed further until we get a, a significant percentage of people filling them out. So the quicker you fill it out, the quicker we can move on to the vivas. And we've got quite some interesting good drivers for you today. So let's not waste time. Okay, if you'd like to go ahead and answer. So uh, Ruth has put the questions as you, some of you started answering. We have 222, uh, 220 participants today. So hopefully we'll have 220 answers. As Juan said, these are anonymous. So we don't know who's answered what. But uh, just to, to check your understanding of the topic, uh, consolidate your knowledge, and Mr. Bajaj will take us through the answers shortly. Please answer as soon as you can so we can um, move on to the virus. Um, while you were. Um, and uh, just while you do, you're doing, the, while you're answering this question, just to say, uh, we have about four or five Viva questions today, and, and we'll try to prioritize those going for the exam in November, and we try to prioritize those who didn't have chances before. Uh, we, can't, we wish we could involve everyone, um, but due to time limitation, we will have to uh, choose randomly a few people, um, you know, based on the exam um, dates. Um, so bear with us, and... Um, We'll try to be as fair as we can. I'm just um, going to we do not record the Viva uh, yeah. section of this, so if you, leave, if you leave, you won't be able to uh, see this later on. Okay, just um, another 30 seconds to answer those. So while people answering, just to say, Mr. Vijay, after this MCQ, um, you're happy for us to move straight away to the Viva or do you have anything else to... Yeah, Firaz, I think the first question, I will make it as a case discussion because it's not fair to put it on Viva. And then I'll do two Viva questions after that. Lovely. Let's do it. So we will continue the recording then. Yeah. Uh, we'll okay, I'm going to end the polling now. Thank you. Thank you. So lovely. So 157 of you answered... Uh, thank you to everyone. Um, so, Mr. Jaj will take us now through the questions. Okay, so the first question was, the subtalar correlation is most common at which uh, facet? And the answer for that is a middle facet of the calcaneum. I think we have discussed that during the talk. And 52% uh, of you said the middle facet. So, majority of you did say the middle facet. So, yes, in the subtalar joint, you've got the anterior facet, middle facet, and posterior facet. The middle facet, fortunately, is most commonly involved because, you know, you can do an excision of the collision in the middle facet. The posterior facet collisions have got the worst prognosis. And thank God, they are not as common. So, it is the middle facet. The second question is, the peroneal spastic flat foot is associated with what? And we did discuss uh, in the in the topic that it was tarsal coalition is the peroneal spastic flat foot 40 percent of uh, sorry 45 percent have said tarsal coalition and again that's a majority now peroneal it's actually a misnomer you know because in a flat foot the heel has been in valgus for such a long time that the peroneal muscles get short and because of which they appear to be in spasm they're actually not in spasm all they are they are just tight so when they try to invert the heel you, the, you know, you get pain and it appears as if the peroneal muscles have gone into spasm. So it is a misnomer. It is just a tight peroneal muscle and not a spastic peroneal muscle. And it is associated with tarsal coalition. And then the third important question was, what is the surgical management of stage three tip post insufficiency? 
So as we said, stage three to post insufficiency was when there was arthritis at the talonavicular and subtalar joint. And there we basically, I, uh, your majority of the answer to that is a dipple fusion. And I'm quite pleasantly surprised because 58% of you have said dipple fusion. I did cover it in the topic. Now, even if you say triple fusion, it's not wrong. Now, why do we go for dipple fusion and not triple fusion? Because if you look at flat foot, the flat foot has got a short lateral column and a long medial column. So when you do a triple fusion, you fuse the calcaneocuboid joint, which means that you can shorten the lateral column further. And moreover, in a flat foot, most of the weight bearing is on the medial side. So the calcaneocuboid joint is not involved. So why fuse the calcaneocuboid joint? So just fuse the talonavicular and the subtalar joint. And you can do that through a single medial approach. You don't even need to do two incisions. And this has been well popularized by Professor Hinterman from Switzerland. So I do the dipple fusion through the single medial approach. And the aim is I don't want to further shorten the lateral column. So that's the answer for the fusion, the stage three tip post insufficiency. That concludes the viva.